you watching on Facebook, uh, we're at the Bowersville Church of Christ for Sunday School. Uh, I am pinch hitting for Kevin today. He is uh, unavailable. And so uh, I look forward to teaching on this first Sunday in January. If you have any prayer requests that you would like to share uh, with this congregation, and keep in mind it's on Facebook so basically everyone can see it, go ahead and post those in the comment section below. And we will pray for those at the end of our uh, teaching time today. Uh, so, 2020 is over. And on Friday morning, Thursday night, we celebrated a new year. I've had the, over this holiday season, I'm sometimes struggling to remember what day is what. You know what I'm saying? Because they all kind of, one blend into the other. And 2020 uh, is over. 2021 is here. And um, a lot of people were very excited about that, weren't they? And one of the reasons that people were excited at the new year more than ever, because most people would say 2020 was not the greatest. And in combination with some of the political turmoil that is still ongoing uh, in our country in a uh, global pandemic, um, we we'll look forward to putting it behind us. I think part of human nature is we like a fresh start. Whether it be a new day, a new year, or a new week, we like a fresh start. And probably now, more than ever. But there's those of us who may ask, especially if you consider sort of COVID-19 to be the defining thing we'll remember about 2020. And it probably will be, right? Because it sort of overtook our lives in a lot of ways. It affected everything. If that's sort of the defining feature of 2020, how is it not the case that 2021, at least in the first half of the year, hopefully not longer, is it, is it going to be a continuation of it? Some think so. How is it any different? Uh, I was thinking about New Year's as a holiday anyway. Um, and thinking about time. So uh, God designed a day to be the earth revolving one time, day, 24 hours, right? So that's built into nature. And then he also gave us the structure of a week, seven 24 hours days to balance work and rest. But then the year is also designed and then it takes like 365 and a quarter days for the earth to go around the sun, right? And really, so the point in which we mark where at this place in the sun it's going to take us 365 days to get back around here is sort of arbitrary, isn't it? It's made up. It could just as easily be July 1st, couldn't it? From July 1st to July 1st. Businesses have this fiscal year, right, that's... Well, I don't know. Is it same for every business? I don't know. I know the church's fiscal year is, I think, from November to October. And so you're just kind of like, and you're like, why do you do that? Well, it's all made up anyway. Uh, my my sister-in-law is uh, Chinese, and uh, New Year's is a huge deal for them. But they don't celebrate that for another couple weeks. Um you think, well, why do you do that? Well, it's just kind of all made up to begin with. Um, other countries use, billions of people on the other side of the world use different dates. And so you think about that and you're like, well, what, is the, what, is the, what do we take from this New Year? So we want uh, presumably some sort of uh, fresh start, presumably some change in our lives. Uh, but we maybe also have to think how some of it's made up as well. Um, and as we think about that, do anyone make New Year's resolutions this year? Here's a theory that I have about New Year's resolutions. <laughs> All of us are like, no, nah, not even try New Year's resolutions. Here's my theory about New Year's resolutions. I think more and more they are going to be something that we don't do at all for a couple different reasons. One of the reasons is this. Pretty much the assumption is, no matter what I say on January 1st, by January 15th or 16th, I'm not going to do it anyway, right? Statistically, they last maybe two weeks, if that. Like, the amount of people that make it from then until March is, it's, 
It's a fraction, very small percentage of people who make it until March with what they set out to do in January. And uh, part of the thing is we live in a society where uh, one of the biggest things that, that is going on is we believe um, that saying that we need to change, uh, that we need to resolve to modify our life, we need to improve in some way, somehow the values our inherent worth as people, right? How dare you say I need to imp- improve or change in some way? Uh, one of the things, um, sort of there's a phrase that describes this uh, that's been around for a while, but has really grown and bloomed uh, recently. And it's the idea of I'm okay, you're okay. I'm okay just as I am. You're okay just as you are. And so any sort of uh, plan or motivation to change is really gets thrown out the window. Um, that is not to say we don't have inherent values, human beings, regardless of our uh, behavior. But you don't take that to say, well, we're just we're going to do whatever we want. We're okay. You need to be okay with it. So. Uh, change is it pretty interesting. Uh, is it a lot of people will sort of swing for the fences, and I think that's one of the problems with uh, New Year's resolutions. You know, if you get to play, if you ever played baseball, there's a certain swing you take um, to put the ball in play, swing for contact, try to hit it back up the middle, and then there's this swing when you get on your heels and you are swinging for the fences. Now, when you always sw- Swing for the fences, what happens most of the time? You strike out, you swing and miss, right? And so that's some of the case. And so the incremental change, changing by like 1% a day or 1% a week. Uh, There's a book called Atomic Habits that talks about that right now. I'm interested in reading that. And one of the things about change is, um, too, is a lot of people uh, think a lot of circumstances are beyond their control. And it's interesting, uh, in basic psychology class that I took as a freshman many, many years ago, one of the things I remember the most was the idea of internal versus external locus of control. So the idea is some people believe that the environment around them is controlling their life. A lot of people believe that they are in control of their life, and that's sort of a, a point of view that people have. Now, the truth of the matter is it's both, right? No one's completely in control of their trajectory in life because there's a there's a, a part of the environment they can't control and then there's a, things you can when you don't think so uh, as we think about in the past year I think New Year's is valuable in that uh, we can reflect uh, there are probably highlights and lowlights of last year but it's important to remember them as we move forward uh, for some of you last year may have been the hardest year of your life and you might have been just ready for it to be over, but some of you have may, may be celebrating wins and saying it wasn't all bad, learning from the hard stuff and moving forward. And so as we start this new year, uh, you need to ask yourselves, do I believe this could be one of the best years of my life? And if so, we realize it won't happen by accident, chance, or luck. Rather, it's taking a different approach to how we do life this year. The reality is some of us aren't seeing life in a focused way. Uh, Sometimes a life or our picture of it is a little blurry. It's hard to know where to go, what to do, and how to move forward. How many of you wear glasses? Well, I can see that some of you are wearing glasses. Almost everyone in here wears glasses or contacts. All right. And have you ever lost or broken your glasses? That's one of the great joys. I had LASIK surgery. Um... A, uh, several years ago uh, and I had contacts before then and one of the great joys of not having to have glasses is that you don't have to worry about breaking them or losing a contact because it can all be blurry uh, if we don't see uh, if we don't have what we need to see uh, it, but when you ha- look through the right lens you can see something uh, and focus. And so we want to talk today about how, how we can have a great 2021 and see through the correct lens is by relying on God's wisdom. 
Uh, he gives us wisdom as a filter through which we can see life clearly. Uh, when we think about wisdom, we may think of a lot of different things. Uh, a lot of times when we think of a wise person, it tends to be an older person, right? It's a wise person because the idea is that experience in learning is accrued over years. And, and an older person is maybe a wiser person. So you may think of, I don't know, a grandfather or a grandmother as that wise person in your life. Uh, maybe an, an uncle. I don't know. Some of you are close to your uncles and can derive wisdom from them. Maybe it could be a, uh, a professor or a teacher of some kind. I don't know, we, we are, or just a wise older person in our life. It's interesting. Literature uh, knows kind of or understands from the human experience that we need wise people in our lives. So if you think of uh, like the Lord of the Rings, they're always accompanied by this old guy named Gandalf. Uh, in Star Wars, uh, Luke Skywalker is on his journey, and at the sort of the center part of that, he needs to meet this creature named Yoda, this old sage, and teach him where he needs to go. And so we know that we need wisdom, and uh, the Bible offers it to us. We're going to be in the book of Proverbs today, and the book of Proverbs is a collection of wisdom that still teaches us how we should uh, live today. So we're going to be in Proverbs 1, 1 through 3 to start off. And it tells us the purpose of the book of Proverbs. Uh, I think it's a very interesting book, an accessible book. It's easy to understand in a lot of ways. And as you go through it, it's super practical. And so as your life experience changes, there are times I can read a proverb and I can say, hey, I, that is true and I know that that is true, not just because the Bible says it, because this particular experience that I've had, uh, this is the, just the perfect description of it. Like, so I'll go through, sometimes when I read the proverbs, I'll think, that reminds me of this, that reminds me of this. Uh, and so it's extremely practical and as you have more and more life experience, as you go through and read it and then as you sort of refresh that, there's more and more that you can remember. So Proverbs 1, 1 through 3 says this. Uh, These are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, the king of Israel. Their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline to help them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives to help them do what is just, right, and fair. Now, just, right, and fair. That's wisdom. And so... I want us to, for a second, to imagine what would happen if every one of us said, you know what, this year I want to live a life of wisdom. I want to be truly wise. What if everyone in our church said, you know what, I'm not just going to do it individually, but um, I want everyone in our church, it's an expectation That we do what is just, right, and fair. That we live lives of wisdom. What if everyone in Bowersville, Port William, Eastern Greene County, Western Clinton County said, you know what? We're going to live lives of wisdom. We're, We're just going to choose to do what is just, right, and fair. Be a pretty amazing and remarkable thing. And so wisdom is, we want a simple definition for it. Uh, It is seeing clearly through the lens of scripture. So we talked about this lens through which we um, can see something. Like when we take our glasses off, we can't see anything. It's blurry. Lose a contact, it's blurry. Um, As sinners, we Typically, well, we'll see the world in a warped way. Warped in a lot of different ways. But if I put on the corrective lens of Scripture and know it and respond according to it, uh, I, I will have wisdom. It's like um, 
It's almost like gravity. It's an invisible force at work in the universe. While we can't see it, we can feel the effects of around it. Wisdom is woven into the fabric of how God created the universe. It is a cause and effect pattern that is based on a moral code of right or wrong. My kids can't, st- well, my oldest son, Micah, he does not like it when I use the word karma. And um, <laughs> he says, Dad, we're not. Is Hindu the Eastern religion where they believe in karma? I think it is. Hindu. Yeah, I think it's Hindu. He said, Dad, we're not Hindu. I said, I don't mean it in the Hindu sense of the word. I mean it in the, in the sense of uh, when the Bible talks about you reap what you sow, but it's easier just to say karma, all right? What you, kinda, what you do kind of comes back around to you. And that's sort of what wisdom is. There's a, there's a cause and effect pattern in this world. If I do certain things, and this is the way God made it. If I do certain things, certain results will inevitably happen. And this is rooted in the very character of God himself. And so wisdom's been uh, around a long time. So we want to jump to Proverbs 2, uh, 1 through 6. And it talks about um, wisdom. My children, listen to what I say and treasure my commands. Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Search for them as you would silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. Then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord. And you will gain the knowledge of God. For the Lord grants wisdom. And from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. And so there are a couple key ideas about wisdom that we want to understand. The first is wisdom uh, comes from God. Wisdom is rooted in God in the way he designed the world to work. He wove it into the very fabric of the world when he created this universe. And when people begin tapping into wisdom and making wise choices, they're tapping into something uh, that God created, whether they realize it or not. So wisdom comes from God, one. Two, wisdom is not the same as knowledge. It's not the same as knowing stuff. We live in an information age, don't we? All right, let's take a random fact. Who's the thirteenth president of the? Who's the thirteenth president of the United States? Does anyone know that? I don't. I just made it up on. on okay, Lonnie, when you were a, a boy. A young man, how would you find out who the 13th president of the United States would be? The encyclopedia. Did you have an encyclopedia in your house? You did. How, who else had an encyclopedia in their house? Man, I, when my parents bought an encyclopedia, I thought, like, wow, this is awesome. We have, and it wasn't, we didn't have an entire, I remember they bought it, some salesman came to our house. And sold us the encyclopedia. And I thought, this is great. Because if you didn't have an encyclopedia, too, what would you have to do? Go to the library. And did, you, did anyone go to the library every day when they were kids? No. So, let's, let's say I... Uh, did you, so you always had an encyclopedia? Oh, man. White privilege right there. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. Edit that out. Uh, so, like, let's say I had a, uh, if, so if I was nine years old and I wanted to know who the 13th president of the United States would be, I'd say, you know what, I'm going to look that up when I go to the library. We may have went to the library once a week. I would go and search, for, and it would take me, I don't know, a little bit of time to find it in the library. And so it's a matter of, no, if I want to know how the 13th president of the United States is now, what do I have to do? Google, who's the 13th president of the United States? I'll know in five seconds. Millard Fillmore. The Whig Party. Eh, we may need to bring back the Whig Party after what's been going on in Washington these days. Uh, so we live in an information age. We have all this access to information. Has it made people any wiser? No. Does the fact that I, now, I can find out very quickly that Millard Fillmore is the 13th president of the United States, does that really help me live in the way that God intended me to live? 
really doesn't. There's some things that we know that are just trivia. And I, we have to, um, we have, to uh, have a certain level of knowledge. Uh, but wisdom is about having the right knowledge and applying it. All right. So Miller Fillm- Fillmore being president really does not help me live a wise life. Knowing the Bible does help me uh, live a wise life. But the key is that I'm using it as a tool to guide me in my life. Uh, I've had con- I have conversations about uh, people, with people, about the people in their lives. And uh, there's been this, uh, f- this thing that people say to me um, when they... Uh, when their family member or someone they care about is clearly not on track with where God wants them to be, right? Not living as, not, as God designed and doesn't really have faith in Jesus. They'll say uh, they've read the entire Bible, okay, which is good. For me to apply the truth of the Bible, I have to read it and know it. But the presumption was um, them reading it had value in and of itself. Knowing what it says. The value is in applying it. Right? I could read Men's Health Magazine this month, right? It could tell me what I should eat and how I should work out in the new year, right? Now, if I read that and then immediately afterwards order a pizza at Mountain Dew, has that done me any good? No. Knowledge is something different than wisdom. Uh, There are even people that have said, uh, so-and-so knows more about the Bible than you do, Brent. I'm like, well, okay. I, I hope that's not true. Otherwise, I want to refund on my tuition for Bible college. That's not even the point. What do I apply? What do I, uh, I, what do I apply? As far as it comes to wisdom, uh, so wisdom it comes from God. It is not the same as knowledge. I would, I would say that it contains knowledge, but it's not the same. And wisdom is very um, practical. It makes an impact on the choices I make in my everyday life. So it's. Um, easy to think of wisdom as some sort of mysticism, this ethereal knowledge in which we unlock the wisdom and the secrets of the universe. But if you look at what the Proverbs say, um, it really has to do with um, how do I manage this situation? How do I act in this relationship? What should I say? How should I manage money? It speaks to all that wisdom does. Um, it's very practical in everyday life. Speaking of managing money, um, I was in the gas station the other day. And uh, I don't want you to take this statement to say that I am, like, militantly anti-lottery. All right? So if I, I ever walk in there and I see you buying a scratch-off ticket, don't think that the eye of judgment is coming down upon you, all right? But what I would say is for a lot of people, gambling is a real problem in their life. Just watching people in the gas station and then having conversation. I know the people who work in the gas station. And so there are multiple people who go in there and spend a lot of money that they don't have um, on lottery tickets. I was in there the other. I, I said that to say this. I was, I was in the. I was in the gas station the other night. Uh, I think it was New, it was New Year's Day, and uh, someone bought a, like a stack that thick of scratch off tickets. It's like, well, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> and the phrase was, "Trump sent me the stimulus money, and I've always wanted to do this." And so this lady, I think she blew maybe her entire stimulus check on scratch off tickets. I'm thinking to myself. So I was going over this. Boy, is that wise? And maybe she didn't need the money for anything else. 
certainly not the best use of it. And so I believe when wisdom is very practical, uh, if you want to say God's word is going to be the guide and even the authority in my life, uh, we will know the right thing to do uh, almost all the time in a specific way and applying principles to everything in our life. So here's a couple of practical things. Proverbs twenty nineteen <clears throat> says this. And just see if this rings true for you in life, if this is practical. A gossip betrays a confidence. So avoid anyone who talks too much. Now, you can say, uh, yeah, I have people in my life who, if I tell them that, they're going to put it in a lockbox. They won't repeat a word into it. And there's other people who say, you know what? If I want the entire, if I want all of uh, Clinton and Greene County to know something, I'll tell them, please, don't say anything. I'm just only going to tell you, and you tell them that, you know, okay, it's going to get spread all over the place, right? Uh, Proverbs 25, 17 says this. It's about relationships as well. Don't visit your neighbors too often or you will wear out your welcome. I've, I've, I've often said there's, all of us have like a threshold when we're around certain people. If you're around anyone long enough, eventually they will annoy you and bother you. It's just different amounts for different people. Some people, you spend five minutes with them, and it's like, all right, I've had enough. I need a break. For other people, it's five hours, five days, five whatever it is. Eventually, someone will bother you. And so one of the things that we've told our kids is when it comes to some of the relationships in their lives that can be a little bit tricky, focus on quality more than quantity. All right? Uh, and on a high note, as George Costanza used to say, that's true. So the Proverbs are extremely practical. Um, it should be, wisdom should be pursued as well. If you go back to uh, the, the beginning of Proverbs uh, 2, 1 through 6, <clears throat> there's a series of words that describe how we should approach wisdom. And they show that we, it requires effort. We're not going to roll out of bed uh, and kind of hope for wisdom and wish for wisdom and then it's going to happen. It says we should listen. We should listen to wisdom. Mike is not here right now, so I will talk about him. I'll tell him I talked about it. But uh, one of his Christmas gifts was to go rock climbing at... Um, Urban Crag. There's an indoor climbing facility in Dayton. He likes rock climbing, so we went. Um, it was much more difficult than the climbing experiences he's had before. I mean, there were some very advanced... I mean, I didn't know that, but for some people, rock climbing is like their thing, like golf or fishing or whatever else is. That's their thing. So there's, this was set up for moderate levels, and, and Micah was... Uh, uh, he did good on the like the medium courses, but when he got a little bit harder, he started to struggle. And it's easy for me to sit there and look up and say, put your right foot here, put your left foot here, blah, blah, blah. Use your legs. Don't try to pull yourself up with your arms, blah, blah, blah. And um, so he's a 12-year-old boy. So what percentage of my instructions did he listen to? Zero. All right, Zero. Um, in fact, I thought about what if I told him to do the opposite? Could I figure a way to like, hey, put your one on the blue, the blue place over there and you put it on the red over there instead? And I think to myself, um, can he not hear me or is he simply choosing to ignore me? Um, I'm, and I thought to myself, I think he can hear me. I think he's just ignoring me because he's a 12-year-old boy. And so the point is that with anything, it doesn't matter how much access you have to instruction or in this case, wisdom, you have to listen to it. Uh, Proverbs 2 says you have to treasure it. It has to be important and valuable to you. You have to concentrate on it. You have to search for it. You have to seek it. If, if the wise uh, life, if wisdom was easy, then everyone would be doing it already. We've got to, it takes a little bit of effort and pursuit in our, in our, on our part. And so we want to ask ourselves, do these words describe your current approach to wisdom, uh, or do we need to change? 
Uh, one of the things that Proverbs 2 tells us is that we need to pursue wisdom with an all-out effort. But it also tells us in verses 7 through 12 of Proverbs 2, Proverbs 2, 7 through 12, that it has huge benefits. Proverbs 2, 7 through 12 says, He, meaning God, grants a treasure of common sense to the honest. He is a shield to those who walk with integrity. He guards the path of the just and protects those who are faithful to him. Then you will understand what is right, just, and fair, and you will find the right way to go. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will fill you with joy. Wise choices will watch over you. Understanding will keep you safe. Wisdom will save you from evil people, from those whose words are twisted. And so on the back of, hey, wisdom is per- needs to be pursued and require some efforts, the benefits are worth it. There is a return on investment. So we want to, as we think about what wisdom is, uh, we just want to reframe the fact that wisdom is seen clearly through the lens of Scripture. It is seeing God clearly. It is seeing ourselves clearly. It is seeing the world around us clearly as we look through the lens of Scripture. We see the Bible it defines how we see our world. So we want to think about uh, living wisely in uh, 2021. And as we think about this, we realize that we'll have a million different choices, right? We make tons and tons of choices every day. Some of them are important. Some of them aren't. But we want to make sure that um, as we see through the lens of, of Scripture and are wise, we want to ask ourselves the question, is this a wise thing to do? What if we stopped before we were making a decision or saying something or uh, doing whatever we might do, um, allocating resources, time and money, attention, And what if we asked ourselves, is this the wise thing to do or not? I have found that taking the deep breath and thinking for 10 seconds in a moment is is not something that everyone likes to do, right? We live in a high-speed society, and we like to act instantly. But what if we said, is this the wise thing to do? Um... If, if in our marriage, if we, before we said something or made a choice, we said, is, is this the wise thing to do? Same thing with our extended family, parents, kids, um, anyone we come into contact with, neighbors, coworkers, friends. Is this wise? Management of our resources. Even something as simple as our uh, social media. Should I post this? Or not. There's certainly times when I wish uh, some of the people in my life would, would, would wait a little bit longer to do that. Sh- should I send this message or not? Is this the wise thing to do? Remembering our definition of wisdom is seen clearly uh, through the lens of God's word today. And if we do that, we'll be amazed about how much God's word speaks into our life. So there's three different areas that we want to pursue wisdom in. Uh, one is in our relationship. Uh, Proverbs 13.20. Proverbs 13.20 says this. Whoever walks with the wise becomes a wise. But the companion of fools will suffer harm. Uh, Of the people in our life, we need to be cautious with who we surround ourselves with. And so I think of it this way. Because a verse like this, when taken out of context and without the entirety of God's word, can get twisted into something else. It can be twisted into, all right, if I see a person who is not following God, who is a not just a sinner, but a blatant sinner and is living a foolish life. Um, I don't want to be around them at all. I need to avoid them with all, at all costs because the companions of fools will suffer harm. And so is that what we want to do? Go that far? 
you take the entirety of Scripture, no, because Jesus was a friend of tax collectors and what? Sinners. So much so that he had a bad reputation. He's around these people. So I want you to think about the people in your life. You have probably a lot of people you know or could know, but you have to ask, within that wider circle of life, if I narrow it down, how many people are influential in my life? It's a lot less, isn't it? And so of the people in your life that influence you, Proverbs, this is what Proverbs mean. If you have a influential if you have a fool close to you in an influential position, eventually something bad's going to happen to you. Harm is coming your way if you hang out with foolish people. Uh, we can do this without being, with, with still being a friend of tax collectors and sinners like Jesus is. We want our lives to be like Jesus. Uh, we do not need to be stuck up or snobby about it. But also understand when it is uh, when it comes to the people in my life who have influence, who if I let become close enough to me, uh, they need to be wise people. So pursue wisdom in your relationships. Pursue wisdom with your time. We're going to hop outside Proverbs and be in Ephesians five sixteen and seventeen. <clears throat> and as that's getting up on the screen, I promise I won't say this again at least for the rest of the month of January. How many hours are in a week? Do the math in your head. 168. Uh, and then there's 52 weeks in a year. So whatever 52 times 168 is, uh, we have a lot more time than what we often pretend we have. Um, we are all relatively uh, different um, scales of busy and so often when we talk about having time or not having time for some people that is more true than others right um, and I could tell you <laughs> how busy I have been this week and um, there's been a, a quite a bit going on considers the week between Christmas and New Year's but I can say how busy can I call myself really if I watched at least six hours of football this week at least six. I mean, is that a busy person or someone that's occupied? I don't know. Not that I think it was inefficient for me to watch the Ohio State game. Because that brought real value into my life. That's what's new about the 2021. You want to talk about what's new, Ohio State beating Clemson. And in our sports minute here that we're going to do before we read this. Even better news, Michigan signed Jim Harbaugh to an extension, so we're going to be being Michigan for years into the future. Uh, I got a new recipe for cookies, is it? Cookie recipe. Put Clemson in a sugar bowl and beat them for three hours. And then you have cookies. Get in that. I laughed at it when uh, Kathy told it to me. All right, so we have time. We have a lot of time. If I'm watching the Ohio State game, I have time. It says... Uh, Ephesians 5, uh, 15 and 16. Can we back that up one to 15 and 16? I must have misspoke. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days of, are evil. And so this year we'll have a lot of options and opportunities. Uh, some of them will be really good, other than will be less than God's best for us. And so what we really want to do is realize that we can't do everything and do it all well and learn to sometimes say no and to use our time wisely. Because if anything is true, we understand that uh, 2021 will go a lot faster than we'd like it to. Uh, it's hard to believe that 2021 is over. I mean, 2020 is over already. It seems like it goes by fast, and each year goes by faster and faster all the time. The last thing we want to pursue wisdom with is our words. Proverbs uh, 18, 20, and 21 says this. <clears throat> and uh, it says this. Wise words satisfy like a good meal, and the right words bring satisfaction. The tongue can bring death or life. 
uh, those who love to talk will reap the consequences. So he says a couple different things. Uh, when talking, sometimes less is more. Right? I, you can probably all think, I know I can't times in my life. If I would have just said nothing, I would have been a lot better than saying what I said. Sometimes I knew I was saying something stupid as I was saying. Sometimes I thought I was saying the right thing. But you know what? Well, how do they say it? Uh, it's better to close your mouth and let someone think that you're a fool than to open it and erase all doubt or something. That, let's go something like that. The idea is sometimes we talk too much, and other times we need to make sure we say the right thing. So uh, if we pursue wisdom in our words, in our relationships, in our time, if we understand it comes from God, it's a gift, we will be able to uh, live a wise life. When we look at uh, our, our lives through the lens of Scripture, and we have all those promises that God will protect us and guide us. So, uh, do we have any prayer requests that came in? All right. Margie, the officer, had a setback this week. Kevin Bear. Uh, he got, he's the one that got shot responding to a, a call. Um, which is just, I mean, senseless that some, someone would shoot an officer over something like that. All right. The family states that as of today, he's improving. But prayers are still needed. And then she also rescued prayer for the Jones family um, from Kingston, Ohio. They lost uh, a father and a son from COVID this week. So it continues to impact people and we want to pray for them. Let's uh, close in prayer. Dear God, we thank you for today. We thank you for all the ways that you have blessed us. I thank you for giving us wisdom as this gift. I pray that we don't leave it unused, but we pursue it uh, with all our hearts and souls. Help us to trust that you uh, know the best way and have given us the best way and, and help us do what we need to do to pursue it. Um, help us to, when we make decisions, whether big or small, to stop and ask ourselves, is this, is this the wise thing to do? Does this honor my father? I thank you that we are your children and can come before you with requests. I pray for those uh, that are listed, that uh, the Jones family and, and Kevin, that I pray that you will uh, be with a family that has lost uh, loved ones this week. I pray that your spirit will comfort them amid their pain and that uh, they would know you. I pray you'll be with the officer that he will, his recovery will be steady and that he will be healed and returned to strength and that um, you'll be glorified in that situation. I thank you for your son and the great hope that he gives us for each day. It's his name I pray. Amen.